Welcome to this week's episode of Top Lines and Tales, your weekly livestock podcast sponsored by Harbour. Welcome to another episode of Top Lines and Tales, and uh, welcome this week to one of our regular guests, Dr. Bob Hoke. Dob- Bob, welcome back. Well, thank you so much. Great to be here. And this week, we're honoured to have uh, Chip Kemp, who, um, in our series of characters on livestock, who is uh, from the American Simmental Cattle Association. Uh, Chip, welcome to the podcast. Well, I uh, appreciate you all having me, and, and I look forward to the conversation with both of you. Okay, and Chip, you've been uh, at the American Cemental Association, I think, since 2017 as a director in charge of uh, ASA and International Genetic Solution Commercial Industry Operations. And What does your job entail? Just, to, just fill us in. <laughs> What's anybody's job entail anymore in 2022? Um, I guess I often tell folks I'm essentially our team's Dr. Seuss. Um, My job is to tell uh, compelling stories out of difficult topical matter. And so sometimes that means I'm working with a commercial producer, um, a young couple who uh, I'm trying to help them understand some of the tools that are available to them to, to kick up the profit potential. Other times it might mean I'm challenging a seed stock producer to step up if they're going to keep their clientele, uh, given the speed with which the business is moving here in the States. Um, it might be uh, an industry level meeting, a packer, a feeder, another genetic service provider. It might just be a board meeting. So my job's to uh, multifaceted, like each of yours, uh, and to help connect the dots on why serious genetic evaluation empowers the beef business. Okay, that sounds uh, sounds like an interesting role you have there. And uh, but you've had a, a fair background before joining the Simmental, haven't you? You've been involved in lots of aspects of the beef industry, uh, Chip, including working with Angus Seed Stock uh, in your younger days, and working for for the Packers. You mentioned the Packers, and working in academia in the university in the food science and, and, and the multi, uh, a multi-level career that you've had that brought you this far. So tell us a bit more about that. Um, certainly. I, of course, I'd, I'd step back and say I, I was pretty blessed. I had a couple parents uh, early on who uh, instilled in me some things that I think are pretty crucial. Uh, at least they have been for my success, uh, uh, a strong faith, a strong work ethic, and and maybe most importantly, uh, relative to this particular conversation, um, they modeled humility. And I, I think that's been important for me. I don't always do it well, and I admit that. Uh, but when you connect the fact that I, I have been blessed to, to be in different levels of the business and the, the, the more and the longer I'm at this, the more I realize none of us has all the answers. And at certain times in our life, we all think that maybe we have the magic beans. And the reality is that's just, that's just nonsense and bunk. And so to me, the, the, the beauty of that mix of things has shown me, yep, I, I, I've, I've learned a lot of things. I really have. And I've met some phenomenal folks, but mostly it's probably highlighted the holes in the areas that we don't do as effectively as we could. And that kind of beget me being uh, in the role I am right now with Simitol. And, and of course, there is no substitute for experience. And obviously, you've got experience in there, I mean, in, in the animal science department as well, the muscle foods laboratory, livestock judging team. You sound like you've got pretty much uh, all the credentials. And, and, and people listen to people who've got experience, don't they? So, and, and, so that has helped you, I guess. Well, um, it, yes, it probably does help folks listen initially. They'll give you about a sentence or two, and you better say something that makes a damn because then they'll quit listening uh, really fast if you don't. But, um, but Andy, your, your point is well said because I can recall when I came back to the university setting after spending a couple years with IBP in Amarillo, Texas. And at that point in time, that plant could do roughly 6,300 head a day. It was the hub of the beef business in our country that essentially dictated the prices uh, that were going across the industry. Um, I was there when Paul Englert sued Oprah um, way back in the day. And so when I came back into the academic setting, there were frankly not very many folks who had an appreciation for what a packer did do, what they could do, and, and honestly, what was beyond their capacity, right? And so it did give me some credit in some, some producer circles 
that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Clearly wasn't the smartest person in any of those rooms, but it did give me some perspective that they didn't have. I think you probably were the smartest person in there from what I gather. You didn't. You won a, a number of awards, a um, Department of Agriculture Livestock Leadership Award, an Outstanding Advisor Award, Outstanding Educational Award Day. Uh, you, 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 you did the job well by the looks of it, uh, Chip. Uh, well, uh, I, I would go back and, and, uh, and slightly correct you. I, I'm confident I wasn't the smartest person in the room. However, I, I, I was blessed to have some level of self-awareness, um, both what I'm halfway decent at and what I'm not terribly good at. And so um, I, I think that level of awareness coupled with some knowledge and some tremendous mentors who put me in some great spots um, and, and helped me be successful – um, those things, you know, those awards you talk about, which I'm very flattered and appreciative of, um, many of those were as much a team effort of, of different endeavors as they were any recognition of my individual success. And I think that one of the things I've always found myself gra gravitating towards are competent teams um, in whatever space I'm working. And, and that's caused me to um, shun some roles as we all three of us and everybody's listening has had different opportunities through their lives. And one of the diffi most difficult thing I've ever had is knowing how to discern that something that on its face looks really cool to, to walk away from that and say, yeah, but that just doesn't fit me. That's often one of the most difficult things I've had to deal with. You talk about difficulty and then you walk into a breed association. And uh, Bob, you've had some experience in breed associations as well. And certainly it's been discussed regularly on this podcast. Uh, not an easy role, not an easy place to be. Uh, Bob, tell us a bit, a little bit about what your take is on the, the state of the breed associations in the U.S. just now. I'd be happy to. And I'm also interested in Chip's take because Chip is, has a unique take on on the business. But uh, right now, and uh, Simmental faces this, is their breeds are really focused. They're, they're changing drastically, breed associations, uh, because we, they are, have very large businesses that are generally commercially oriented, selling bulls, multi-million dollar businesses. And, but the majority, and that's the majority of the revenue of a breed association comes from these big businesses. But the majority of the membership are very small producers, often not pro there's profit is not part of their scenario. It's not part of their goal. It's a, it's a, oftentimes a lifestyle, raising kids, lots of good reasons to be in the cattle business. Uh, just an off growth of having a little bit of land, you know, wanting to run something on it. And, and so you have those two dynamics, these very large businesses that is the majority of your revenue and very small businesses that often aren't profit oriented, but each one of them has a vote. They're democracy. C twenty rule, Bob, isn't it that uh, eighty percent of your business comes from twenty percent of the people, and the other eighty percent are a pain in the ass? Am I allowed to say that? Prob <laughs> probably. <laughs> you can you can say that, but but you know everybody has a vote, and and where the, the rub's going to come is whenever you know the, the, the smaller businesses threaten the large businesses. And uh, or the non-businesses threaten the, the ability of the large businesses to make a living, sure. and so right now that dynamic's kind of kind of rubbing, and it's it's going to be interesting to see how that comes out. Chip, what do you think? You know, uh, I agree with a lot of what I've heard. Um, I would say, you know, I, I had opportunities. Let's put it this way: I had opportunities in the past to go to work for a number of different breed associations, just based on some of my background, not because I fit or didn't fit, but because they saw the credentials and somebody called. And I turned all of those down prior to Simmental. And the reason being, and there are some exceptions, and I do agree that this space, be it associations or societies, is evolving. But to a large extent, uh, these endeavors have become pom-pom waving, uh, charlatan promoting efforts to just say, hey, we're the best. Why? Well, I don't know, because I said, <laughs> I don't have an appetite for that. Mm -hmm. um, life's too short. I got better things to do. And so I think I'm quite blessed, to be frank. And I, Bob's heard me say this, Andy. I think I work for the only breed association on the earth that doesn't function like a traditional breed association. Okay. Um, we deal in the truth and the facts, recognizing that we're wrong sometimes. We'll own that, get better, and move on and charge ahead. 
Um, and we do have some of the, uh, we'll call it um, unnecessary drama that you two described a moment ago. But in general, even despite that, the business of Simmental has been remarkably successful in recent years. Um, and I think in large part because I, I'm given, as all my colleagues are given, the latitude to say the hard things. And sometimes that's going to upset some folks, uh, but facts are stubborn things, as we know. And so that's the way we function, and it's not just so much shameless promotion. And the other component is we openly function breed agnostic. And the beauty of that is iron sharpens iron. That's made Simmental into a force in North America it, it couldn't have even dreamed of 25 years ago. Right. Couldn't even sniff. As our friends in, as Bruce Holmquist, um, the leader at Canadian Simmental, so oftentimes says, Andy, he says, American Simmental did something that's never been done. Mm -hmm. You came off the do not buy list. Okay. And not only did we come off the do not buy list through some serious efforts of breeders and leadership, uh, but we are smack in the front of where things are. In fact, uh, you know, a Andy, you're certainly familiar with some superior livestock in this country. And if you look right now uh, with data, not just because Chip says it or Bob says it, I mean, I have the, the data shows the most valuable calves on that platform are Angus cattle. Sure. That's a victory and a big change. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the superior livestock auction is a feeder calf video auction that sells millions of head of cattle a year. Uh, through uh, over the video, yeah. and uh, most people sit at their computer and buy their feeder cattle, and it's a, it's a huge component of our feeder cattle sure. market, and and it is really a price driver, and so that that yeah that is a uh, Sim Angus has come a long way. I wrote the history of the breed for its 50th anniversary, and they they did work their way onto the where no one would use the cattle. I mean the breed was dead basically right. in the 90s, mm -hmm. and and they, they took a 15-year course to get them back on track. And it's the only breed I, that I know of that did, was on the no-buy list. Usually that's a permanent thing. They're the only ones that ever got off. Let, let's just <laughs> let's just move on. That's yeah. fantastic what you're yeah. saying, how far you've come. And let's just move on and look at a little bit of the cattle themselves. Because in the UK, we have the Simmental Breed Society. And obviously throughout Europe, where they came from. And they, so they're a, a big red and white animal, heavy-boned, you know, mainly as a cow breed used in, in, in the UK. You guys have changed that around, haven't you, And, and, and for your commercial buyers. So what does the Simmental look like there now? We'll talk about hybrids maybe in a minute. But what about the... Yeah, the Simmental, the percentage of Simmental's, uh, um, what, yeah, what have we got crossed in there? What do they look like? Um, it's a complicated question. We certainly uh, appreciate and respect our roots because they've done some really powerful things that we should touch on shortly that, that make us currently relevant in a whole host of areas. But just to keep it fairly superficial, if you were to drive through uh, most Simmental programs, there are exceptions fairly few, um, those, you would not see spots. Um, most of those cattle overwhelmingly would be black, solid black, or maybe have just a touch of white on their face. Uh, a number of programs are keen on solid red. Um, so that's what most of those cattle would look like, solid bodied cattle with the occasional white mark. In many, many cases, you'll see no white anywhere, maybe outside of a, an udder or, you know, way back under that belly. Um, that's where things have, have gone in this country. And, and clearly we'll talk about why that is, but that's what most of those look like. If you were to look at, um, our population in general of Simmental, uh, well south of 2% of the cattle in our database presently are full bloods or fleck fees or, you know, kind of that foundation creature that bought us into the, into the business, mm -hmm. essentially overwhelmingly we're a, a hybrid population of what we would delineate as purebreds, um, higher semi-influenced uh, uh, hybrids, and then uh, semangus type cattle, which are closer. Well, this is an overgeneralization, but closer to a 50-50 composite. And you mentioned the semangus, and Bob mentioned it as well just now. So the semangus, is that a straightforward scimitar cross angus first cross? Uh, no, no. It, it's um, much more evolved than that. It, many of our semangus breeders... Uh, they identify the breed composition that best suits their commercial clientele. For many, that's, you know, 
maybe an eighth or a quarter semi. In other cases, it might be three quarters semi. Um, and so there's a wide swath that that can work with. And equally as important, though most of them do flirt around that 50-50 space for some reasons I'm certain we'll talk to uh, here in a minute. But the other component of that is these are multi-generational composites that we can predict genetic value on just as clearly, just as accurately as we would any what you would call a full blood creature. To our listeners say that uh, on, on our side of the water, the, the, the pedigree animal is king and, and, um, and traditional and, and very, very uh, um, protected. Snobbery, I suppose, around keeping the animals pure and, and not allowing even a percentage, and in some breeds they've allowed maybe a fraction of a percentage into a breed to, to improve it a little bit. But you guys are just so far away from that, and, and uh, the, the, literally the entire Atlantic between us is totally different. To, it's a totally different being, isn't it? And as I said, hybrids really are starting to creep into the UK, and we'll maybe talk to somebody else on this podcast shortly that's, that's doing a little bit of that. Um, but it's it's mainly it, it's blasphemy to our European breeders to to, yeah. to hear yeah. that you've got a got a, um, a breed society where less than two percent of your animals actually are what we call originally full bloods. Yep, a- amen, Andy. You're right. Blasphemy is the right word that I would think a lot of your listeners are hearing. The thing I would remind is that we still track pedigrees. We still track knowledge. We still get performance data. We're using genomics. We're using, in many cases, far more genetic knowledge tools in these composite programs than we ever were just a few years ago in these, you know, quote unquote, pure breeds. To me, it it really boils down to this is what aligns with the commercial producer's ability to generate profit. Hmm. And it, it, it's just the height of arrogance and factually incorrect to believe that any one breed holds the market on all indicators of profit. Um, and as a result, finding ways to add breed complementarity and heterosis um, just makes so much sense. And so um, there are different ways to do that, clearly. Years ago, we thought of this in terms of complicated breeding schemes and all that. Now we think of it a little bit differently. But the, to me, it really boils down to one thing is, well, just to be blunt, if you turn cows into a religion, you're doing it wrong. Um, I have a religion, thank you very much, and it's not my cows. And, and so often, that's what becomes. And so people would look at me as a, as a heretic, and I'd say, well, I'm only if you call me a heretic by definition, then you look at your cows with a bit of religious fascination that I don't. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. I totally hear that as a religion. I've never considered that before, and some of our listeners there will be, probably be shouting at the at the radio sets just now. But I totally hear what you're saying that when people do get into a breed, and I breed pedigree um, sheep as well, and and. Uh, it, 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 you, you are, it is a religion, it's your breed against everybody else's breed, where in the, in the real world, of course, you said there's, there's only one goal, and that's to let's, let's make some beef here. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Well, can I add one thing really quickly? Is we are talking about pedigree livestock. I mean, the, these, the components into these animals are all pedigreed animals. You know, the, the, this isn't taking some, you know, random commercial cow and breeding it to a Sibintol. Mm-hmm. I mean, these, these are all uh, pedigree components. So all the genetic components are known and can be quantified and, and, and get the genetic predictions that Chip's talking about. So these are pedigree livestock. And Bob, you've worked with a few uh, other breeds. I mean, in this particular instance, would an animal have that much uh, of other breeds in it that you could register it in a different society? Does that work? Can you have a Sim Angus and say, I can, I might, I might want register it as an Angus, or I might register it as a Simital or a Charlie or something else? I mean, are they, are the other breeds playing ball on the same on the same thing? And 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 where where are the blurred lines? Or, or... Well, well, I mean, you could uh, like Red Angus has an open herd book, and if you bred a a Sim, Sim Angus, you could you could register it either in the Red Angus herd book or in the Simtol herd. Book. Not both of them. No. Well, yeah, you can do both. You can do yeah, but if you, <laughs> getting, if you want to spend the money, this is getting so so the. Yeah, so so the interesting thing, Andy, is you're right. I mean, this is the question is. Even here in the States, the composites are clearly on fire. I mean, for so many reasons, mostly just because they dollar out 
in a much more responsible spot for commercial folks in the business at large. But still, some of the things we talked about a few moments ago, they clearly exist here. And if you look at the breed associations who tend to function with an open herd book um, and are working in the manner that I described a few moments ago, almost all of those are partners inside the International Genetic Solutions Platform. And so we're all working collaboratively together because one of the very basic premises of IGS is that no single breed is the entire answer. Yeah. And so those groups, those populations of producers and associations who have accepted that and are willing to work that way have almost all coalesced, not only just in the US, by the way, we have a number of groups in Australia, we have a number of individual uh, producers, ranchers, seed stock operators in Australia and New Zealand and other parts of the world, folks who are eagerly wanting the most credible science on Mother Earth and want to be able to do it on any breed type, regardless of breed composition, are finding their way into this IGS platform that, that Simital spawned. Okay. And, and with regards to uniformity, again, I'm just sort of thinking out the box here. I mean, we, we're using different people or different um, genomes from different breeds, should I say? And, and are, are you end, are we ending up with a very uniform product across there? Because it sounds to me like they could you know, the animals could breed one way or the other. So maybe we should look a little bit closer into the how into, into how the hybrid works, I suppose. Well, yeah, that that's interesting because that is history historically the big argument. Well, you're just going to get a hodgepodge, and and actually it works totally opposite of that, Andy. Because what folks are doing is thinking about the end in mind and making breeding decisions for that end. And as a result, these aren't haphazard mongrelizations, right? These are, I almost never use the word crossbreeding without using the term responsible crossbreeding. Okay. This is forethought. And so as a result, what you find is people are building toward their own particular business goals. And so it's exactly the opposite. And so because of that, we have a more uniform crop coming out of these individual producers. And yes, they can select different pieces, different genetic components to build their operation. But off of their operation and off of their commercial clients, they're more uniform than they've ever been. And here's the primary reason why, is once you embrace hybrids, for one, you get a better cow. Um, in every level, we know the beauty of a hybrid in terms of uh, maternal prowess, right? Her breed up is better, her longevity is better. Uh, she requires less help from management at almost all fronts. But historically, what have we done? Let's just say we were using, let's just use the Sim Angus approach for a second. Historically, we just said, well, we use an Angus bull for a little while. We'll put him on some cows. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back and hit a semi back on those daughters. And then we'll go back and forth. And as a result, every set of daughters looks different than the set of daughters before. So the cow herd has built in difference. So the difference in that traditional crossbreeding model without hybrids caused your cow herd to constantly vacillate from one extreme to the other of those breed compositions. The beauty of the hybrid is you find the hybrid of your choice, whether it's a, a Delphi balancer, um, whether it's a Limflex, whether it's a Sim Angus. And over time, what happens is you start to find this sweet spot where you get a cow herd that's roughly 50-50 of the breeds of interest. Do you have maximum maternal heterosis? Certainly no. But you have a maintainable, manageable level of maternal heterosis. And now you throw a composite bowl on top of them. You have calf uniformity, responsible heterosis, and you're functionally using your pasture setup in the same way you would if you were just breeding purebreds. So it's, you get a better product, a more uniform product, and it's still the easy bud. Uh, uh, wow. Andy, I need to add something here sure. because there is one thing that in the UK and, and with the limousine population in the United States, when you have the myostatin gene and you have that you know, either heterozygous, one copy in the, in the, in the, pedigree animal or two copies you know where if you have two copies you're going to get a uniform calf crop if, if you have homo heterozygous where there there's only one copy of the myostatin gene and so half the calf crop gets myostatin half doesn't then you will that is the one area where you will lack some uniformity and that's about it but that that's something that you would need to consider in the uk 
Let's just my hashtag add, is fairly, fairly probably. Absolutely. You've, absolutely. you've raised a very key point and a key word, should I say, the myostatic gene. As you know, in in, uh, in the UK, the shorthorn and the Angus are trying very hard to stamp out the myostatic gene because they say that it doesn't it doesn't improve the beef in the way that, that an Angus should. So what's what's your take on that? My, my take is, is it's a... Uh, it's a particular uh, gene that should be used uh, carefully. Uh, it's definitely not going to help your cow herd, but it, uh, if you're going for a lean uh, product line, I mean, certainly it, it will add muscle. And, um, you know, it, it, if, again, if you get into this space with the hybrids, you, you really need to have, be careful that you either have it fixed or not fixed, you know, either home – homozygous either way without it or with it you know but otherwise you will get uniformity problems okay. chip what do you say well, and, and, and i would say it, it, it's intentionality right know what you're trying to build and to bob's point once you've determined what you what you intend to build what you intend to market how you get the greatest premiums then you decide on the responsible use of that gene okay. clearly it has a deleterious impact on females um and you combine that with the fact that at least in the states, at least in the parts of the world that are really driven to this highly palatable kind of high marbled product, you know, the North America, Australia, New Zealand, um, and, and of course the Pacific Rim to the extent they buy it, um, that, that product guides a certain model. And in markets where that's not the guiding force, it changes things a little bit, but... Even given that, the cow typically, cow maintenance cost, cow replacement value, tends to dwarf any differential in terminal calf metrics. And so we love to talk about, well, I made a premium on my terminal calf, and that's good. The question is, did that added premium offset the additional cost, work, exercise that went into maintaining your cow herd? Sure. And frankly, many times it doesn't. And so, but, but again, the... That particular gene is one that just know what you have and know how you intend to use it. Don't allow it to be an accident. Okay, okay. Well, I, I hear that. And uh, Bob mentioned to me uh, a chip before you came on there. He said, uh, yeah, you're, you're a man that speaks your mind and you admitted that yourself. And uh, I think he said one of your say, sayings are that producers need to be self-aware about their cattle. And uh, I, I understand it. Explain that a bit more. Um, yes. If you don't know what you have, uh, I just don't have an appetite to listen to folks gripe about uh, different uh, what they would perceive. And I hate to use this word, but I'll use it just to, to stoke the fire as they would perceive certain injustices in the marketplace. That's nonsense. The reality is we live in a world where our customer, in this case, at some point that customer is a packer mm -hmm. and we are blessed because our packers are abundantly clear, at least in the U.S. and certainly in Australia and other places, and I suspicion uh, in, in, in Europe as well. They're abundantly clear what they want. And for us, what do they want? They want cattle that can get big, stay healthy, stay lean enough to be tolerable, and marble well in the process. That's a gift. Rarely is your customer kind to you. Now, the question you have to ask yourself as a producer, am I making cattle that fit that model? If I'm not, then you better either decommoditize yourself and work outside the commodity business or quit whining or get about making cattle that somebody wants to buy. Okay. Now, in the trade-off of that, you still have to think about this as a business. Blue ribbons abound, and that's fine. Um, hey, if, if you want to hang ribbons on your wall, that's lovely. But if you want to stay in business so there's a snowball's chance that you can hand this operation on to your kids and grandkids, that's what I'm about. Okay. And to help you do that, you actually have to make a profit, not just revenue. Sure. And so that means you have to evaluate your cows. What are they doing for you? Do they help you produce the right kind of calf to sell? How expensive are they to maintain? Those sort of things. And so I think the base level, like any manufacturer, just so happens our manufacturing plant works on four legs. Mm -hmm. no, no business would try to sell widgets without knowing 
the efficiencies built into their manufacturing and deficiencies that are built into their manufacturing sure, plan. Sure. We have to be just as aware if we're going to stay in this. Sure. I'm going to move on, on to another subject. I, mean, I appreciate that what you said. I move on to a, a slightly more uh, controversial subject, that of the carbon footprint. And, and in the UK, there's certainly a, a little bit of a lean for, for the public, public anyway to want to see sustainable um, grass-fed beef, which, which is, is, is not easy in the... How does the hybrid fit in, into the carbon footprint uh, side of it, which I imagine you, your, your packers are now starting to, to look at? Sure. Um, well, at first, I would push back that grass-fed beef are kind to the carbon footprint. I actually think there's plenty of data that suggest that isn't necessarily the case. Um, and so that maybe is for a different conversation. So we're going to agree to disagree potentially with some of the audience that the only way to reduce carbon impact is to put them on grass. And, and again, I can guide you to folks who can make that discussion more meaningful than I can. But my contention is that any point in time I can require less feed input and get the desired outcome of the quantity and quality of product that I need, um, that's a win. Mm -hmm. And and we can't disconnect that from uh, institutional profitability as well. And I think the beauty is, is the hybrid clearly is best suited for that in almost every way. No, scratch almost. That's that's just crap. Um, They're better suited in every way for a couple of reasons. One, the hybrid cow will last longer and she can, if mated correctly, um, 1,600-pound cows are not going to be carbon kind. Sorry, that's just true. Um, but that hybrid cow can last longer as a result that takes less to replace her, meaning um, heifers, what's the most expensive thing we do in a business? Feed replacement heifers that do nothing for two years. And so the fewer of those I have to make, the longer my cow can stay in production responsibly and generate what I need, that's a win. Um, and so I think the hybrid cow clearly has an advantage. She'll add a calf in her lifetime. That's old data and everybody knows it. Um, but then on the other side, on the terminal standpoint, you know, we just talked about the maternal heterosis, but direct heterosis is, is crucial. But you combine breed complementarity to maximize efficiency in the yard. Now, that efficiency isn't always... I mean, there are lots of measures of efficiency. Some of those are just marketing and selling points. Some of them are true. Um, But again, just in a gross big term, if we can be more efficient to produce the product in the feed yard and a responsible crossbreeding program is always going to beget that, regardless of your end goal, whether it's more of a high cutability lean product in Europe or it's a combination of high cutability with marbling um, in other parts of the world, uh, there, there's a no spot where I can see where a hybrid doesn't have an advantage mm-hmm. if built correctly. If built wrong, anything doesn't work. Uh, yeah, can I, can I add to that really quickly? Yeah, I, I would agree garbage in, garbage out. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to have high quality uh, ingredients. And the other thing is the breed complementarity. You cannot forget about beef quality combined with muscle yield, whether you're in the United States or in Britain. Now, I, I, can't, I know what happened in the United States when we had a war on fat. Our per capita consumption went in the tank. And, and we, we went put and put marbling back into the cattle. And, and a hybrid does give you that nice balance of, of a British uh, uh, ability to have, add marbling with a muscle of a, a continental. And it gets you that balance. And if you get it out of balance too far one way or the other, I mean, you're going to have a lot of fat on the floor, or you're, or you're going to really hurt the quality of the product. And 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 in our case, in the United States, when we went too lean, we we just our market just tanked. Sure. When we put some fat back in them, we got our per capita consumption back. Can I make it really real, real quick, with a data set I have in front of me? We just got some data back yesterday on some calves we had harvested last week, and I think hybrids also do something else. Um, We know that uh, British cattle really struggle in a feed yard setting to go to some of the the heavy weights that we're looking for in the U.S. right now um, without starting to have some heart failure issues and those sort of things. That's not calling them out, to be really clear. It's just built into them. A lot of the continental folks will want to crow 
oh, our cattle are fitter and more healthy. And, and there might be something to that, but it's not a damn thing that we did in the U.S. That was built into them a long time ago in Europe, right? If you were a simian, you couldn't pull a cart in the mountains. They ate your sorry carcass. And so um, we got a lot of that out of the gene pool long before any of us had to come around. But there is a bonus. And so to make it really practical to what Bob just said, we're able to make cattle who can get to some substantial weights, marble at a level, level that appeals to our, our, our palate here in the U.S. and other places, and still stay lean. So this group of cattle I was looking at yesterday, Bob, I don't think I even had a chance to mention this to you. We shipped a bunch of cattle that range from – um, like 1390 to 1700, just a smidgen over 1700 pounds. Lightweight, yeah. And we didn't get, we got lightweight, one carcass. Yeah. We got a, we got one carcass. Yeah, lightweight. Um, we had uh, one carcass that got a smart, a smidgen of a discount for being too heavy, but that was only by five pounds. Those carcasses had one select on that load. Everything else was choice and prime. Two thirds of the load was prime or CAB. And all of that's cool. That's great. But the cool part to Bob's point, now listen to the back fats on those cattle. When we scrolled down the back fats on those cattle, we had a calf that was at 0.7. He was an outlier. We had calves that were down in 0.1, 0.2. On average, the average was about 0.37 on these large, heavy carcasses. And they're grading high choice and prime while we, we had multiple yield grade ones on that load. That's rare. Um, and so no yield grade fours. You can, you can thread the needle. These are almost all Sim Angus cattle. You can thread the needle, not because one breed is all that, but because when you responsibly put them together with heterosis, you can do some things. And you deal with a lot of commercial data um, through the, the Simmental Society. Do you process a lot of... Let, let's just maybe go back to something called uh, the EBVs we have over here, EPDs. How, how, does, the, how does the hybrid get... Uh, how does it, does it figure with EPDs against, against maybe other, other more um, concentrated uh, seed stock animals? Sure, sure. Uh, so, so Simmental, through our IGS effort, um, is responsible for the largest genetic evaluation on the planet. Um, and that is fully a multi-breed effort. So every animal in there has directly comparable EPDs to every other animal. Okay. Um, that makes it really valuable at the commercial level. You can compare a, the, the weaning weight on a red Angus bull to the weaning weight of a composite limousine bull or an Angus bull or a semi Angus bull. That, that removes a lot of minutia math and clutter and confusion for the person on the ground trying to make decisions for their family, right? And so... Um, as a result, if you're the largest genetic evaluation, that means you're bringing in a lot of data. And we do. Um, we have well north of 20 million cattle in the database um, at about 400,000 a year. Um, lots of genotyping, lots of contemporary. One of the questions some of your serious seed stock folks are going to say is, well, how can you do that? Because your contemporary groups don't mesh up. Actually, that's the interesting piece. We have so many breeders who will have contemporary groups with well, in that contemporary group, they might have a, a purebred semi and some Angus cattle and some Sim Angus cattle. And because they're turning all those in, and we do that thousands and thousands and thousands of times over, we can start to get a sense of the horse race between the breeds. And so that's how we do um, the multi-breed approach. Now, when it does come to hybrids, they're equally as comparable. But we have to account for heterosis, right? Because we got to remove that in our EPD or our EBV calculation, which we can do for our friends in Australia. It, but most of them have actually transitioned to the EPD approach. Um, and so all we need to do then is determine what level of heterosis is impacting in that animal, which between both research and academic data, plus our own pile of internal data, we can get a really good handle on the heterotic bump of different traits, whether that's growth or ribeye or what have you. Then, of course, we remove that heterotic piece and then report those EPDs um, after that. Okay. Okay. And look, were you responsible for putting some of that together? You've been there, what, five, six years now? Is that, is that your baby in, in there that's uh, gathering all this data, or is there a whole crowd of you, or did you inherit a lot of this stuff? Oh, this has been ongoing for many, many, many years, uh, long before our current model, 
we had an ex we had a relationship with two renowned researchers at Cornell University who start started us on this approach, um, and then going back essentially during my time, the effort to build what is now known as the IGS model using slightly well using distinctly upgraded software and 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 using some of the modern hardware. Frankly, we couldn't do some of the things we do right now if we didn't have some of the hardware upgrades just computationally it wasn't possible uh, before. So we have a genetics team. Uh, I'm blessed to get to work with those group, those folks every day on a variety of efforts, but they're much more versed in the, the mire and the math than I am. And the nice part is not only does Simital have a, uh, an IGS, have a tremendously robust set of scientists starting from our leader, Dr. Wade Schaefer, who's probably the indexing savant on the planet, all the way through our genomicist and our geneticist. But because going back to where we started at the very beginning, we know we don't know everything. So we have a technical team who joins every month. They have at least multiple calls. And these folks, we have somebody in New Zealand. We have people in Australia. We have folks uh, occasionally from Europe. We have folks all over academia in the U.S. who are involved in this all the time. So one, that makes us, that gets us better because we have more brain power than any one group could possibly put together by itself. Secondly, it keeps you from believing your own hype because you have folks on the outside constantly looking under the hood going, okay, what's this about? And it forces us to, to self-evaluate on occasions. And that, that's healthy. It just doesn't matter how noble your intent. If you don't have that check and balance, you can get sideways. Sure. And, and, and your meat background, of course, as you said, worked for the packing plants before you came down that's, that route, um, will have given you a, a lot of insight into that. And have you studied sort of meat across the world? You talk about Australia and the Pacific Rim market and, of course, the UK market as well and the, and the, the different grading systems and the different requirements. Have, have you looked sort of, have you used a lot of things from around the world or are you guys just leading the world? Uh, no, we certainly are humble enough to recognize that uh, we don't need to just be forcing our model on other folks, right? Um, we need to work with, with what makes sense for them and, and their production system and their marketing schemes. Um, with that said, we do have to be able to interpret it. So at times there are probably some models that, that there's not enough data to allow us to, to piece together. So we would have to recognize that. The, the, the beauty of, Again, those places around the globe that are really emphasizing meat palatability and, and, and eating experience in, in the, you know, uh, in the model that you would think in, uh, in some of the places you described, um, there's not as much difference in their grading systems um, as there is similarity. Yeah, they give different names. They might have a slightly different threshold here or there. And we can work through those things in particular, for example, uh, we have loads of Australian clients and their system is slightly nuanced from ours, but the basic premise is the same. So as we've worked through some of those adjustments, it took a little time. We had to learn a few things, um, but, but we don't find that to be a big challenge. It's just a, a little bit of a learning curve. And we're upfront about that when a, when a new breeder or a new association comes on board. We've had a, um, a an Australian on here a couple of times, and, and the buzzword in Oz seems to be the, the, um, the Wagyu beef these days, maybe because I suppose they supply a lot in Japan. Is there a Wagyu creeping into the hybrids and the composites with you yet? Yes, um, uh, both Wagyu and, and the Akaushi um, are, are creeping in in different places. Um, we have some of that data. We increasingly get more. One of the challenges with some of those sorts of programs globally is a lot of times they, they want to operate inside of a, a black box or behind a veil because they, again, they think they're holding some magic beans. And if they share their magic beans, then uh, somebody else will beat them to the punch. Most of the time, that's just nonsense. And so the reality is um, we find that some of those audiences are a, a little more um, hesitant to share. But with time, as you talk to them and they come to realize that the more I share honest facts, the more folks are going to want to do these things with me. And if you're going to drive something like Wagyu, for example, you got to have critical mass. And so you might have a great product. You might have a really good Studebaker, which is an old car line in the U S. Um, but, but if you can't meet the needs in mass of your customer, you're going to die on the vine. And I think as those folks realize we have to, 
have this this dance, this balance of keeping enough control and enough autonomy, but also actually getting out there and measuring ourselves against other breeds. I think you see that's that that's really a growing sentiment amongst the serious large scale industry relevant breeders of those types. Okay, okay, I get that. I'm gonna gonna raise another subject another question, should I say, with regards to seed stock. Is there such a thing as a seed stock hybrid sale? Can you do you go can we go online and, and there'll be a, a sale of five hundred hybrid bulls that uh, that are out there on the market and, and with all the data available? Is that is, is that a is that a thing? Uh, certainly. Uh during bull sale season, every day. And 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 that's beyond just Simmental. Um, you can do that with, with Gelvy. You can do that with Limousin um, to a lesser extent with some other breeds. But yes, in the Simmental space, the overwhelming majority, I mean, the overwhelming majority of our bull sales are hybrids. Okay. Whether they call them Sim Angus or they call them purebred, they're ultimately still hybrids. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Certainly fascinating to me, and I said we've heard this subject a few times, uh, and uh, I think some of our UK listeners will be starting to take a little bit of this on board. But we've we've gone round the circle, I think, with this subject, and that's uh, fantastic to hear. And Bobby, do you want to add a little bit more to to uh, to how the hybrid is actually impacting the the industry on your side? You know, I I think Chip has said it so well. You know, I I remember back in 1999, I tried to get a crossbreeding ad the breeds to get come together to do a crossbreeding ad it was like pushing a rope up a hill and, and we finally got an ad out it was two plus two equals five you know because that's if you get a full heterosis and breed complementarity that's the math and uh and but they we had a moving set of partners we ended up with simtal limousine and red angus and we got that done and and now today and then and we were so crude in the way we were designing crossbreeding at that point. And now these cattle are, like Chip has said, they're custom fit to the people's environment, their management, feed resources, and market. And and those are all different for every operation. Even ones that they're just separated with a strand of barbed wire, they're going to have separate environments, management, feed resources, and market ultimately. And also the, the people were going to see much more specialization more people buying replacement heifers and specialized bulls, less people uh, designing their own. And we're, we're going to see this. This is a changing industry rapidly. Mm -hmm. And and Chip has brought a lot of this up very well. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's been fascinating. As you said, you have you have totally evaluated it and, 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 and crystal clear, really. And Chip, is this, are we still going forward? I mean, you sound so enthusiastic here. Is, is the hybrid going further and further? And is it going further afield, maybe? I know we've certainly seen a few of them creeping into the UK. And I think we're going to chat to Lee Leachman in a later uh, episode, who, who I think is selling you know, quite a few hybrids now in, into Europe anyway. Do we see all the breeds disappearing and becoming one, one hybrid breed? I think as we think about genetic evaluation i think we are pushing closer and closer to where we need uh, a singular robust evaluation that gives you clear answers of a variety of breeds and breed types and breed composites and then to bob's point you can determine which ones fit your environment your management your marketing scheme and they won't all be the same cattle um but so do i think hybrids are going to grow i think as folks this business gets harder and harder and if those, there are a lot of folks listening who are gray headed um, and they have more experience in this business than I can possibly fathom. And I defer to those folks. If they say, you know what, this is just gobbledygook, I, I, I'm out. And I say, hey, amen, good on you, congratulations. But before you tune out, I would ask just one more thing. Is there a snowball's chance in hell your kids and grandkids can stay in this business doing it the exact same way you did it? If not, then the, let's at least discuss all their potential alternatives. And so whether it's the beef on dairy space, which is growing globally and the hybrids are clearly the, uh, the hot spot there, um, whether it's just traditional native beef production, uh, I think there's zero reason to think this will slow down. And, and so I, I would encourage you, Andy, don't hesitate that you're going to get some folks that maybe between myself and Lee's commentaries in your next podcast, are going to push back and they'd like to challenge it. And that's good. Um, I'm, I'm always open to have these serious conversations. If you're, if your passion and your interest is really um, digging into this, we may come down to different points and that's okay. Um, hey, disagreement's perfectly fine for me. 
but don't hesitate to give them my contact information. I relish the opportunity to visit with them if they have a different perspective. Great. Well, I certainly probably will get a bit of pushback, as you said. And I know um, we've got a few of us coming over to uh, Montana later in the year and, and looking at some animals there and some quite high-profile breeders, I suppose, coming with us. And it'll just be interesting to see the differences and the widening chasm that it seems to be, be happening between uh, Europe and the United States. And, and I suppose uh, one other subject, I suppose, that would have driven all this forward for you, Chip, will have been the availability of technology. And, of course, you know, the, the, the computing power, not just on, on you know, the, the, the big um, uh, servers and what have you, but now with, with the power of phones and mobile apps and that sort of thing. And has that made a huge, huge difference, huge impact within, within the, the, the way that the, um, the data has been gathered and, 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 and processed? Uh, no question. Actually, that, that's a, it, it's a phenomenal thought for me to go through that exercise that you just brought, Andy, because I think it impacted a couple of things. One, yes, from an eval standpoint, clear, right? We, we, the same premises would have held even prior to some of the modern technology, whether that was computing power or DNA or just various digital things. Um, the same premise would have held, but it, would, it was much more cumbersome to make it happen. Now, frankly, it's remarkably simple. Um, doesn't make it easy. But it's simple. But the other piece of that, that same sort of technology you described, I think that's an underlying component to why breed associations out of necessity have to change. Because in 2022, it, from my standpoint, a breed association serves one purpose. One purpose and one purpose only. And that's serious, credible genetic evaluation. Now, we have some other tangential things that we do. We, we all put on some shows. We have some youth things. And those are all lovely and appropriate. But if they at any level get to the forefront, if they become the core mission, then you're setting your commercial clientele up to fail and fail poorly. And so with that said, that technology then that we used to have all these folks running all over the world um, telling the story, were they telling it accurately? Were they blowing smoke? Were they setting up little fiefdoms for themselves? Eh. But the nice part is now, an association can, commu can communicate with its audience and its customers very clearly digitally. That means they're, cost they're more cost effective. They don't need um, pom-pom waivers driving all over a continent um, telling a story in the fashion they want to tell it. They can just get the truth and the facts from that association. <laughs> That's a brilliant evaluation of it. And, and, and uh, I certainly see... As you said, the technology is still moving forward yet. And uh, Chip, we, we've run over a, um, a long period of ground here and been very, very interesting. And uh, um, Bob, I thank you for bringing uh, Chip to our attention because uh, it's, it's like something I've never heard before. And, and uh, I think it'll open a lot of eyes to a lot of lot of our listeners about uh, about can, how the hybrid is, is getting in there. Can I say one thing though? I mean, we hybrids are not going to eliminate the purebred inputs. I mean, we always need those uh, genetic lines back in the background that we can remake these things. Mm -hmm. And if we lose them, we're in trouble. Well, and so, I was just going to say that's a spot on right. So don't take the fact that we believe that multiple pieces of the puzzle um, work together to mean that you don't need the individual pieces of the puzzle. The American pig business is a perfect example, right? The American pig business is totally composite all the time. And it should be at the commercial level. But increasing years, the serious uh, germplasm firms have started really reemphasizing their effort on the strength of those pure lines so that they can make those appropriate um, built composite stock. And so these things, it, it, it's not a mutually exclusive piece. This is a collaborative thing. And so those who are serious... Um, lovers and breeders and appreciators of purebred stuff don't feel threatened frankly if you're really good at doing that you're going to be more valuable than ever before in a hybrid model now if you're just got a gawker and a hanger on good on you uh you might be pushed to the side if you don't step your game up a little bit um but this doesn't threaten that need i think bob is spot on about okay okay no, that makes a lot of sense that you do need the pedigrees to keep the hybrids going. And uh, without getting into too much detail into the makeup of some of these hybrids, which I think we might discuss in another episode, I think, uh, I think, uh, gentlemen, we'll bring that one to a close and, and very much appreciated. And, and as I said, a highly interesting episode to, for myself and, and our listeners. Great. 
So thank you, Bob. Well, Chip, thank you very much for, for taking up the time. I know you're a busy man, and they say when you want a job done, ask a busy person. But uh, thanks very much for taking uh, to, to giving, giving us the time. And Bob, as always, I know you're a busy guy too. So uh, um, thanks very much, gentlemen. Well, it's been fun. Thanks, Chip. My distinct pleasure. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. See you. All right, bye. bye. Okay. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Top Lines and Tales. As always, kindly sponsored by Harbro. If you are looking to visit the Royal Highland Show next week, please make sure that you drop in to see Harbro on their trade stand. And if you are at the Royal Highland Show, look out for myself. I'd love to meet uh, people and listeners of the Top Lines and Tales podcast. I will be there in a number of guises, including the commentary team on Cattle and Sheep. And don't forget, you can always look up uh, Harbro on social media and also Top Lines and Tales on their Facebook page where there should be photographs and other input to back up this and other episodes.